So we're going to take you into the, the weird and wonderful world of clinical modeling. Mm. And uh, I guess I could uh, introduce myself. Um, my name is Celia Juslambake. I'm uh, a Norwegian nurse and uh, clinical informatician. And I worked in uh, clinical modeling in Norway for uh, full time for about five years now. And I also uh, run the Open Air International clinical modeling program with my colleague from Australia, Heather Leslie. And we're, together with Ian, we're going to talk about archetypes for social care and genomics today. And I think you're going to start off, and Ian. I am going to start off, yeah. And are we There's on this the clicker, clicker here? there. Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. Yep, it's fine. I'm the old guy, I can't read it, it's too small. So I'm going to have to quick, oh, beg your pardon. So. Um, we got two topics which are really contrasting, uh, genomics and social care. We're not going to try and mix those two things just yet, although maybe in 100 years' time it will be one and the same thing. Um, I'm going to talk about, briefly talk about uh, three projects that I'm aware of. A couple have been involved in directly, but mostly other people have been involved in them. And just to give you a flavor of the, the breadth, you know, so people talk about genomics, but they actually mean some very, very different things. And then we're going to talk about some of the challenges that we have as we see going forward in this space. So the first project uh, is a 100,000 genomes project. And the lead of this project, John Reed, is actually sitting in front of me. And I've nicked his slide. Sorry, John. It was the easiest way to get the information up there. Thank you. That's easier. Um, this is a really interesting project. So 100,000 genomes project, people volunteer to contribute their DNA, <clears throat> and that's all handled by Genomics England. We had nothing to do with that modeling at all. The, if you like, the raw DNA, sampling, analysis, storage, nothing to do with OpenEHR. There's the whole other bit, which is the clinical phenotypics. In other words, it's the signs, the symptoms, the lab tests, the radiology, everything else. It's contracted out to what's called genomics, uh, 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 genomics medicine centers, one of whom uh, or one of which is the North Thames uh, Genomic Centre, which uh, John's been involved with. And John would be much better telling you the background to how they decided to, to choose OpenEHR. Basically, their challenge was to get data from a number of North London hospitals, big institutions like UCL, Great Ormond Street, the Royal Free, Moorfields, and to collate that and then send it on to Genomics England using some standardized uh, messages that were predefined. And John will tell you that those messages are pretty messy. Um, the data is not particularly well understood. It was built by people who understood the analytics world, but didn't actually understand the way that the source data was co be collected. But anyway, um, I worked with, with, with John's team, and basically we built a whole bunch of uh, archetypes and templates that mimicked the clinical phenotypics uh, uh, content of the, the uh, uh, Genomics England required. It's quite an interesting project. It was different from most. So you've heard me already saying the extent of reuse. And typically, a project that I'm involved with, all, every one, I would say, of the ones that you've heard about, there probably is 70 80% reuse of archetypes. In other words, you can use the same thing again and again. This one is a little bit different. And the thing that skewed it was rare diseases. So Genomics England gel project was about cancer and rare diseases. Rare diseases have rare observations. They have rare measurements, rare kinds of images. So we found ourselves building a whole lot of not actually localized archetypes, but new archetypes to cover that problem space. So that was um, uh, ah, here we go. So here was oh, it's just going a bit slowly. So here was what we ended up with: uh, 26 templates. 13 for rare diseases, 11 for cancer, and two were kind of, um, uh, if you like, administrative things. 99 archetypes, 44 of which were international. 22 we localized, in other words, we adapted it to fit local circumstances, and then we had 28 purely new ones. I would say about half of these actually would go back up into the international space. The second project, um, is actually come out of a collaboration between a Sardinian um, research team, CSR4, 
and the HiMed project that I think Tomash talked about earlier, where they were looking at genetic variants. All right? So this, again, is not just the, rare, the, the DNA sequencing, but it's trying to identify things that are different and are clinically or potentially clinical, mean, clinically meaningful. So again, you see the subtlety in here. So genomics is not just about DNA. It's about the clinical phenotypics that has to line up with that. And it's not just about that raw sequencing. In order to make this stuff usable and actionable, we've got to take There's other kinds of information that, that, that come in the middle. And the third example of that is something that we developed quite recently. So both CSR4 and the guys in HiMed were involved in this, uh, I can never remember, GA4GH is an international collaboration to pull together clinical phenotypics information and ultimately expose it through a fire interface. And we realized that actually there was a pay place for this phenopackets idea. Now, phenopackets, is a, it's an open source, a very nice open source development. And it seemed to be about a different way of expressing genomics and clinical phenotypics information. And we thought, well, at first we thought, well, why, why would we do that? You know, we're already, it's kind of duplicating what we're doing already. It seemed to be um, competing, but actually it's not. We, we discussed it with our clinical colleagues and they said, well, no, this kind of clinical phenotyping is what we use. This is our trigger for clinical activity. So we decided to effectively emulate the phenopackets data models. So we developed a whole bunch, and our colleague Heather Leslie, I think basically in one weekend, mm -hmm. built all of these clinical phenotype, uh, phenopacket archetypes so that we could use this as a holding space because this is the sort of thing that our clinical colleagues will use when working with patients. So just a brief overview of the kind of differences that we're finding as we dig into this world. So over to you. Okay. Um, moving on to the area of uh, social information. Um, the Urban Air Clinical Modeling Program has been working on this for a number of years already. Uh, and we've started with uh, things related to discharge planning uh, initially. Um, issues like, uh, does the patient have anyone at home to take care of them for the first 24 hours after uh, outpatient, outpatient surgery? Or uh, does the patient live on the fourth floor without the lift? Um, and if we're looking a little bit deeper into this area, uh, we discovered that this is not a small area at all. Uh, it includes things, things like housing and relationships that I just mentioned, uh, but also things like income, education, occupation, communication, nutrition, disability, age, sexuality, gender, ethnicity, as well as access to healthcare, clean water, electricity, and the internet. And we also discovered that this is um, not only a large area, it's a complex one too. Um, and of the parts that we looked at as of now, we've spent a lot of time making out where are the limits of each concept, um, and hence where are the limits between each archetype. For example, is there a difference between whether you have a roof over your head at all and if you're, uh, maybe you're at risk of being evicted, and whether your said roof over your head has a fridge for storing your insulin? Uh, or is having somewhere to go every day and feeling like a useful part of society the same thing as being employed in a paid job? And we haven't really quite got to the bottom of that, but those are the kinds of questions that we had to ask ourselves when we're modeling these things. Um, in any case, uh, we've been working on this for a good while, and we've been teasing out some of the different concepts and getting some archetypes published, uh, and some of them still being reviewed or on the drawing board. Um, and there's no more, there's a lot more international interest uh, in this area of modeling. Um, and I think we'll see this work ex uh, accelerating in the next few years. Um, if you're interested in participating in this work, then please give us in the um, uh, clinical program a ping so we can hopefully include you. Now, of course, this of course looks manageable, um, but there are some challenges that we still have to handle. Um, some of them are generic to all modeling, uh, while others are more specific to these particular areas of information. And I think you're going first with yeah, that, Ian. So one of, the, one of the issues that anybody who's worked in this space will understand this, but there's a lot of people who actually who are commissioning things like uh, LICRAs, that's the healthcare record exemplars, 
who don't understand that there is actually a big gap between the way that we collect data and the format of data, the questions we ask at the front line, compared to what it gets by the time it's been processed, reprocessed, and repurposed, and goes through to the analytics space. And that's a big problem. It's not a direct connection. It's not a pipeline of frontline data, which is suddenly available and of, on of value. So just as a very simple example, a lot of the data that you get, even at, at clinical registry or quality improvements level, and certainly when you get into the research and pure analytics space, there's a lot of questionnaires. There's a lot of direct questioning, like does the patient have diabetes? Yes, no. But in the original system, certainly in a GP system, there will be no such question. There will be the patient has a diagnosis of diabetes. Now, in pure computational terms, that's a that's a text or a coded term, and the closed question is a Boolean, and actually the, the name of the thing is the question. So that's just a very simple example, and there's much more complex examples. One of the great papers that I've come across in, in uh, health informatics is this called EORTIS, um, and I can never remember what it stands for, but I'll try. So aggregation, organization, reduction, transformation, integration, synthesis. Got it. Right? And it just is a fantastic explanation and exposition of how data is continually repurposed in systems. And depending where you hit it in that cycle, it may well look a little different. Actually, the clinical process model that Tamar showed on his slides maps that quite neatly. The S, the synthesis bit, bit is an evaluation in our world. The other stages are of, are of observations. But that data gets further repurposed and squashed and squeezed as it comes out to be fit for the, the analysts at the end. And we need to remember that. Right? There's a lot of work being done. In the GP systems that I worked with, the data was used directly for analytics. That's not the case in most of the other health systems we use. And that's going to be a long-term job, getting those data increasingly pulling the questions we want to ask directly from the source data, but we've got a way to go there. And we'll always need a curation step, because there are always going to be missing data and incorrect data that we can correct before it gets moved on for analysis purposes. And just as an example, um, here's a very simple example from the 100K uh, uh, Genomics Project. We've got a uh, this is, the, if you like, the requirement for the output to send to gel. They have a question called duration of HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Where does that come from? Well, it might come from a medication summary archetype. So quite often, particularly in registry type things, people ask for summary of lifetime use of a particular product or medication, or maybe a group of, group of products or medication, a class of medication. So we have a special archetype called medication summary that captures that life -term, lifetime use. But it's a summary or aggregation of the information that comes from the original medication order and the dispense or the administration. So this is the kind of archetype we use in a source system. This is how it often ends up but we also sometimes have to capture this intermediate format. Now, this is imperfect, but right now it's the best we can do. And people who are commissioning systems and expecting data to flow neatly and freely have to be aware that this is a state of art right now. So one of the issues, lycras and data lakes. This is my colleague Ewan Davis took this at a health informatics meeting we had some years ago, and it is danger deep mud. Um, and, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat, I think is the answer. I think it's you now. Um, did we lose the picture? Ah, there it is. Okay. Um, going back to social information, um, Localization um, is one major challenge that we're already starting see, started seeing in several areas. Um, and this can be as simple as language. Uh, as it can be as naughty as different legal requirements in different uh, jurisdictions. Or it could be more elusive, um, like climatic or societal differences. For example, while having access to an insulated and uh, heated living space is critical in northern Norway, it may not be as important in northern, northern Australia. Um, similarly, the access, access to healthcare itself is a major social issue in the UK, 
uh, but uh, sorry, in the US, <laughs> uh, but not as much in the UK. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, in the same way as Ian just showed for the um, the um, uh, genomics information, social information is often used in registries. Um, and registries have to get their information from somewhere, and prefer preferably that should be from the EHRs. Um, and also preferably uh, without clinicians having to act like the world's most expensive copy-paste system in between. Um, and as you can see for this, from this example from the Norwegian National uh, Reporting for Addiction Medicine, registries sometimes aggregate their data in ways that does make a lot of sense for statistical analysis, but not necessarily for clinical recording and follow-up. Uh, and this means that in some cases, the same information needs to be structured in different ways between clinical systems uh, and registry use. But registries have to take care to ensure that it's actually possible to machine convert uh, uh, from the clinical data into the uh, the uh, format that they're asking for in the registry. Sometimes that not, that's not the case. Um, and when working with this kind of information, it's important to recognize that um, standardization is not a one-off uh, activity. It's a continuous process. Um, we will get new requirements. We will get changed requirements. Um, and through a continuous improvement process, lead to new standards complementing the existing ones or revising the existing standards. And luckily, open air can cope with this um, through translation, through specialization or into local versions of archetypes or templates. Uh, versioning of single archetypes is also a very important um, functionality that helps us do this, but also failing fast at the local level um, through the quick development test and deployment cycle uh, that open air systems allow. And really, all this brings us back to the principles for modeling the clinical world. Uh, clinical information models must be defined by healthcare professionals, uh, so there must be a very low threshold to participate. Healthcare changes all the time, so models must be changeable when needed. Model content must be predictable, so tight governance is uh, required. Vendors and solutions come and go, so models must, must be independent of vendors. Clinical modeling is difficult and expensive, so modeling must be done once and shared freely. And persistence and exchange must be based on identical concept models, so models must be suitable for a variety of use cases. And Underpinning this is the old seemingly paradoxical concept of pragmatic standardization, um, where we divide the domain into bite-sized chunks, start using them as they become ready, revise as needed instead of waiting for a predetermined revision cycle, select our battles really carefully, and of course we grudg grudgingly accept that things will never be perfect. And as Ian mentioned initially, uh, there's an inter interesting observation about the two kinds of information, the air two areas that we talked about today, is that um, genomics and social information sit as almost completely opposite ends of the uh, uh, spectrum of healthcare information. Um, and I'm not going to say which one is which, by the way. Um, but one of them is defined by highly discrete biomedical variables and is more or less the same everywhere, right? Genomics is... You won't find many differences in genomics between Norway and, and um, Australia, for example. While the other one is rather loosely defined and much harder to pin down uh, and has a high level of variability across countries and climates. And at the same time, both of them are really necessary to, to be able to deliver actual, for example, personalized medicine. Do we have time for this one, Ian? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> So this is just a cautionary tale, right? What we're doing is giving power to clinicians. And when we, we actually mean not just clinicians, you know, domain, this is social care people, patients, citizens, anybody who's a legitimate stakeholder. But this is what happens, right? The Glasgow Coma Scale. Glasgow's really only famous for two things. One is the Glasgow Coma Scale, and it also features in an ABBA song, and that's about it. But just to the west of it, there's a lovely little town where I was a GP called, called Clyde Bank. 
And you see already the Glasgow Coma Scale, this is just from Wikipedia, has been revised and adapted many times. And we see this all the time. Everybody keeps chopping and changing. Because as clinicians, we're actually very empowered to make up our own stuff. And you know, we've got to stop doing some of that because it's causing chaos. It won't happen right away, but we have to start taking some responsibility. So I thought, well, why shouldn't I have a go? So I've developed the Clydebank Coma Scale, uh, extended the Glasgow Coma Scale with the terribly important Clydebank category. So we've got E for eye response, V for valve response, M for motor response. We now have I for inebriation. Um, and we have a scale called from going from stony, called sober, to tiddly, to pished, which is a Glasgow expression, to bladdered, which is an even better. And you can see that basically goes from, you know, is more sober than his doctor, uh, down to out of it, expect a call to the big white telephone shortly. Um, but I've done even better because we came up with this fantastic, um, we came across this fantastic, I should have said, the German translation is, is a visit to Villeroy and Bosch. Yeah. Um, and you may think this is ridiculous, but Silly actually sent this example a couple of weeks ago. So we've been fighting with these scales and scores. And a scale and score basically was a number between 1 and 10. So this is the, the Borg scale. So they, they said there's a number between and 10. Choose, you know, where are you on your pain scale or your breathless scale between 1 and 10? And then they came up with this thing, which is like, I don't know if you're familiar with spinal tap, and, you know, turn it up to 11. You know, the dial has 11 on it because we're such a loud band. We have to have 11 on our, on our uh, martial amps. And this is what they've done with this score. They've said, you can have anything between 1 and 10, but actually you can have anything else you like. You know, we'll have infinity and beyond. And this is just the Scottish phrase for this, gonna need do that. In other words, please desist from doing that, my, peer, my dear chap, because it's just going to cause chaos and does. So we have responsibilities. We're gi being given power as clinicians and other care, care people, but we have to start, stop making up stupid uh, scales and scores and other stuff. Thank you.